And you've heard a lot about validation um, this morning. So Christopher's going to give us a lot more of the details. Yeah, and I'm, I am thankful to Pavel for already showing how to get to it through the GUI, um, since I, I only touch on that pretty lightly here. Can, can you hear and see me? All looks good. Excellent. All right. So yes, I am Christopher, Christopher Williams here from the Richardson Lab to talk about model validation and going from diagnosis of problems to healing of problems in models. And the diagnosis looks something like this. Mole probity validation provides a great many, uh, provides feedback on a great many different sorts of modeling errors uh, and provides, and if you're looking in our King viewer, provides this this suite of visual feedbacks. Some of these are also available through Coot. Uh, and if you use Isolde, Isolde has uh, some similar and some similar and related markup that communicates these same things in a way that's appropriate to that software. So this is the diagnosis and the healing looks something like this. So this is a plot of clash score, which is one of our validations, and I'll explain it more shortly. Clash score in the protein database as a whole over the years. And you can see that when Molprobity introduced clash score to the community, and then when clash score became available through the Phoenix GUI, there were dramatic improvements in the overall quality of structures deposited and released from the PDB. So you really can make a difference by paying attention to validation, you really can make a difference, not just to your own structure, but to the, but to the community as a whole and to the database as a whole. So as, as Pavel has already shown, you can get to the Molprobity validation plus other validation through the Phoenix GUI uh, in the validation tab. If you want more on, if you want more on this and it's very useful integration with Coot, there's a tutorial in the Phoenix tutorials on this. There's also a YouTube tutorial that provides some, provides guidance here. You can also get to this validation through the Richardson Labs Molprobity web server uh, shown here. And if you want some, addi some additional quick references for how to interpret Molprobity results, I've written some, some visual guides that are linked on the Molprobity main page. Uh, and those guides also contain links to relevant publications. If you go and run a structure through the mole, through mole probity, you'll get a validation summary that looks something like this. And this is the sort of whole structure summary. Uh, Pavel has already shown where, what that looks like going through the Phoenix GUI. And it's essentially all of the same information just presented in two different places. For this talk, I'm going to be referring to the Molprobity, the Molprobity web page summary you see here, just because I think it's a little bit more visually stimulating and we're, we're remote, we're on slides, we need all the visual stimulus we can get. So we provide a great many different validations. I'm going to just walk through them and give you a feel for what each of them where each of them comes from and what each of them means. Starting with clash score. And if the Richardson lab has a signature validation, it's this one. And our starting point for this is hydrogen atoms. As, as Pavel noted, if the hydrogen atoms constitute basically half of the atoms in a in a macromolecule. And so Phoenix and Molprobity have tools to add 
hydrogens to mol hy add hydrogens to structures so that you get all of those atoms. And it's important because, again, the hydrogens are the atoms that make most of the interatomic contacts and are involved in many of the chemi important chemical interactions. Then, once we have all of the all of the hydrogens, we roll a small spherical probe over the surface of the atoms. Here, treating atoms as hard spheres, which is a which is a reasonable approximation for these purposes. And where where the atomic spheres get close to each other or overlap, we we mark those locations. So where where the spheres get close to each other but do not quite touch, that is a van der Waals contact. Where spheres overlap between appropriate donor acceptor pairs, that is a hydrogen bond. And where atoms overlap but are not appropriate types of pairs, that is a steric clash, which is an, an impossible thing to have happen. And so those are marked with these bright, with bright red. So what you don't want to see is a whole bunch of these bright red clashes. What you do want to see is something more like this. This is beautiful van der Waals packing, clo close packing, all the atoms just gently resting on each other. This is what you want to see, especially in the hydrophobic core. Next is rotamers. So protein side chains do not just flop about at random. They have, they assume predictable discrete conformations. And because most of the atoms going out along a side chain are tetrahedral, generally these conformations fall into stack fall into staggered orientations around these tetrahedral centers. And here you can see one, tip, one typical rotom rotomer for arginine. Of course, especially for a long and complex side chain like arginine, it's not as simple as there just being one or two correct answers. There's a whole galaxy of real rotomers. So here you can see one slice of the conformations that the valid rotomeric conformations that arginine can assume. And each of these clusters is each of these clusters is a peak around which uh, a family of uh, a close family of conformations lives. And so when you have a rotomer outlier, what a, when you have a rotomer outlier, that is to say something that falls outside any of these known peaks, what you want to do is move it into one of these favorable local minima so that refinement can sort out the details from there. Next is Ramachandran. And if there is an absolute classic uh, protein structure validation, it is Ramachandran analysis. This dates back a long time. Uh, it is a validation of the protein backbone based on the based on the phi and psi torsions. And these days we break we can break Ramachandran we can break residues up into six distinct categories for Ramachandran analysis: glycine. Isoleucine and valine together because those two have branched C beta atoms. Two kinds of proline, both cis and trans. Preproline, that is residues immediately preceding a proline, which really do have a distinctive distribution, and everything else as a general case. And so we've made contours of expected Ramachandran behavior for each of these cases. And in these contours, there is an inner bound that represents the most favored conformations and an outer, and an outer bound that represents less favored but still allowed conformations. 
And residues that fall outside that fate, that allowed boundary, are considered to be outliers. Again, as Pavel mentioned, Ramachandran, the Ramachandran plot is subject, is vulnerable to a certain amount of overfitting, partly because it's been around for so long. Uh, this is a bigger problem in cryo -EM and lower resolution crystallography. And these are, and what I show here are unrealistic Ramachandran distributions, but they appear good from a strict, from a strictly, from a strictly statistical standpoint. These appear to be good Ramachandran evaluations. The one on the left, especially, m almost all of the residues fall within the favored bounds, and there are no outliers. This looks much better than it really is. And so, and so to help deal with this, Oleg has introduced this new Ramachan z-score or z-score validation. This is a validation not of individual residues, but a validation of the Ramachan distribution as a whole. And when the and the further from zero the Z score gets, the more improbable the distribution is. And this, this too is reported in both Phoenix and Molprobity. Next, the Molprobity score. This is a synthetic score that serves as a, a quick approximation of the overall quality of a structure overall model quality of a structure. It combines the three validations we just talked about, the clash score, the number of rotomer outliers, and the number of fav Ramachandran favored residues, combines them and scales them to look like a resolution. And that is, that is the Molprobity score. And this is a lot like the polygon assessment in that it gives you a sense of how your structure compares to an average structure of the same resolution. If your molprobity score is better, is about the same as your resolution, you are about average. If your molprobity score is better than your resolution, you're doing, you're doing well. If your molprobity score is worse than your resolution, you probably still have some work to do. Next. C beta deviations. The C beta is the first carbon atom out along the side chain, and it is unique among the side chain atoms in that its position is completely knowable from the positions of protein backbone atoms. So we can so we calculate the ideal C beta position from the backbone atoms and then measure the the distance or deviation from that ideal position to the modeled C beta position. And in the markup, we draw a, we draw a purple sphere with a radius of that distance. A significant, a significant deviation between the ideal position and the modeled one is an indication of some kind of modeling problem. And while the C beta deviation looks like it is a side chain validation, it is often a, an indicator of some sort of backbone strain, either at that residue, either at that residue location or somewhere nearby that has forced the local backbone to squish or expand in an unfavorable way. Covalent, covalent geometry. There's not a whole bunch to say about covalent geometry, really. We have expectations of the, the size of uh, covalent bond lengths and covalent bond angles, and we check and we check against those ex expectations and mark mark uh, covalent bonds that fall outside the expectations. The significant thing here is that Phoenix uses a confirmation dependent library. To, to generate geometry expectations and generates these based on local Ramachandran confirmation. 
And this allows it, this allows a more, a more fine-tuned, uh, I'm never good with whether this means it's precise or accurate, uh, but a more precise or accurate uh, assessment of geometry based on the actual local conditions. And that is one of the advantages of Phoenix, and it uses that both for refinement and in this validation. Cispeptides. The peptide bond that joins adjacent amino acids has partial double bond character because of the nearby carbonyl, carbonyl oxygen double bond. That means that it is planar and it and therefore assumes either a trans or a cis conformation. Almost all the time, this is a trans bond. However, occasionally it's cis. Most, most cis residues are proline. About 5% of all prolines, uh, the peptide bond preceding a proline residue, about 5% of all of those are cis. And so that is a cis proline. Non-proline cis are vanishing, are extremely rare, and residues like the one on the far right that are twist that are twisted more than 30 degrees out of planar are vanishingly rare and probably just all wrong. The really interesting things are these non-proline cis residues. Here, here, here we see a cis glutamine, and, this, and you can tell from this electron density that this is real, even though only a fraction of a percentage of non-proline residues ever assume this conformation. That makes them interesting. If you see one of these and it's real, you can bet that there is some reason for it. Some, some sort of functional or structural importance. So you don't want to, you don't want to model these where they don't exist, but where they do, you want to make sure you preserve them. What you don't want to do is model something like this. Here are three proline, here are three residues, here are three non-proline residues all in a row, all cis. This, and there's, just no, the density absolutely does not support doing something like this. This is absolutely not a correct thing to do. Also, also something to watch out for, uh, cis proline, cis, cis residues at chain ends. Again, the, the cis conformation is a little bit unfavored, so you need something to hold it in place and at the end of a chain, there's nothing to hold it in place. So, so cis residues at the end of chains are basically always wrong. The reason something like this gets modeled though, is that the cis peptide is a little bit contracted relative to the trans conformation. And therefore it fits slightly better into contracted electron density like you might find at the mobile end of a chain. But it doesn't fit enough better to justify doing something this rare, this unusual, and this strained. So something to watch out for. Next, kablam. Kablam is a validation for protein backbone, especially at low resolution or in cryo-EM. It is a powerful alternative to Ramachandran evaluation when Ramachandran is either overfit or uninterpretable, as it can become at low resolution. And the basic idea here is that the C-alpha positions and the C-alpha trace are better, are relatively well modeled even at low resolution and even when the rest of the model is not very good or has severe problems. So what Kablam does is it 
uses a pair of C alpha dihedrals to describe the local C alpha trace. And then, pre and then from that C alpha trace, predicts probable peptide plane orientations as described by the, the lower measure on this slide. And from, and from that, it can both identify outliers that don't match those predictions and suggest likely confirmations that would be, that would fix the problem. So if you look at this markup in, in our King viewer, you'll see something like this with hot, with hot pink bars drawn along the pair of peptides, along the pair of peptide planes that are in an outlier confirmation. And Kablam is particularly good at assessing secondary structure at low resolution. And if you, if you look at the C alpha trace on the left here, I think you can see why. I think you can have an intuition for this. From just this C alpha trace, if you've looked at structure almost at all, you can tell this is an alpha helix. Even though if I put all of the atoms on here on the right, this alpha helix has some severe modeling problems. It, it has its peptide planes twisted all out of, all out of order. And so the Kablam markup shows that these are outliers and these residues score very well on probability of them being alpha helix. So it, it can do both of these things, both identify outliers and suggest the fix up. For, and for non-secondary structure, we've introduced a, a new, a relatively new markup for Kablam in the form of these disks. So this disk is drawn around samples, peptide plane orientations, scores each of them for Kablam, and then the disk is colored based on how well putting the peptide plane in that position would, would score for Kablam. Pink for outliers, purple for disfavored, and open for favored. And so this becomes a visual representation of where the favorable local minima are for this particular residue. So if you could move the peptide plane, move that carbon oxygen over into this open area, you would probably break out of an unfavorable, uh, you'd probably break out of an unfavorable minimum into a more favorable one, and then refinement would hopefully be able to sort out the details. Next, undowser. And undowser is the only thing on, that is ex currently exclusive to the mole probity website. Everything else is both here and in Phoenix. Uh, it is one of my ongoing projects to move undowser into Phoenix in the near future. So undowser is an expansion on our all atom contacts and clash score analysis specific to water. So undowser looks at the looks at the waters in a structure, specifically the waters that are clashing with something, and tries to categor, categorize the reason for those clashes and the way you might fix them. There are a great many different kinds of there are a great many different causes for incorrect waters and waters that clash. Uh, I will show you just a handful of them to give you a sense of the sorts of things that Undowser is looking at and making recommendations on. For example, here is a water that should actually be an ion. And we can tell that it should be an ion because this water is clashing with multiple atoms of like polarity or like charge. And that's, that's a strong sign that, that, that a water should be an ion instead. And that this, this water has a very strong density peak associated with it. That is also important to identifying an, a probable ion. On, on, the, on very much the other hand, here's a water that has 
no density and clashes with a bunch of different types of atoms, both, pol both polar and especially nonpolar. So an ion probably wouldn't be clashing with nonpolars and probably would have density. This probably just shouldn't be here at all. It's probably left, probably got trapped here or was left over from something else. Just delete this water. And a third interesting case, here are a pair of waters clashing with a nonpolar and maybe clashing with each other. And they do have density. And what's happened here is these waters are occupying the, the location of an alternate conformation of this aspartate side chain. So the, so the fix here is to build an alternate conformation and delete these waters. Now, most of the validations I've talked about so far are specific to proteins. Ramachandran, Rotomers, Kablam, C beta dev are all protein specific validations. But we also do validation for nucleic acids, RNA specifically. Some of our validations are universal, like clash score and geometry analysis. Others are specific to RNA. And the first of those is RNA sugar puckers. The, perpendic the perpendicular distance from the backbone phosphate to the glycosidic bond vector is a strong predictor of ribose sugar pucker. And that will make a lot more sense when I show you this picture. So here you see the two ribose sugar, sugar puckers, C3 prime in brown and C2 prime in green. And you also see the, uh, the three prime phosphate down here near the bottom of the image. And for each of these, we've drawn We've extended out the, gly the glycosidic bond vector. And you can see that depending on whether it's C2, C2 prime or C3 prime, that glycosidic bond vector passes either very close to the phosphate or very far from it. And that is a very strong, and if you've got the wrong sugar pucker for where your base is, this is a very strong signal about that that's happened. If you're using Phoenix, you probably won't see very many of these because Phoenix is aware of this during refinement, but it's a good thing to know about. Second is RNA backbone sweeps. And sweeps are a rotomer-like description of RNA backbone. Thing is that RNA backbone is difficult to deal with. It has many, many more degrees of freedom than, uh, than the protein backbone, where the protein backbone has two, two torsions in it, phi and psi from Ramachandran space. The RNA backbone has seven, which makes it much more difficult to describe and gives it and allows it to, to wiggle around a lot in, if you have something like this vague density on the right. So what the sweets system does is it simplifies the many degrees of freedom in the RNA backbone by grouping torsions together. And, it, and this, this sweet system spans two different, uh, two different residues, and it groups the delta, epsilon, and zeta together into, into, one, into one unit and assigns a number to their collective conformation. And it groups the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, other delta, into another unit and assigns a letter to their collective conformation. And so you end up with a number and letter pair. 1a, for example, is the most common helical conformation of RNA backbone, which gives us a way to quickly <clears throat> gives us a way to quickly describe RNA backbone conformation and anything that doesn't fall into one of our one of the expected letter number combinations 
is therefore an outlier. It would be, a, at this moment, it's appropriate to mention a powerful tool called Eraser that's available through Phoenix. And this is a tool for improving RNA structure. Uh, and here, here's an example of Eraser at work, Ta taking a RNA structure with many bang bangs, which are sweet outliers, and turning it into a good good RNA confirmation with a bunch of real sweets. Eraser is not specifically aware of the sweet designations. It's just very good at creating good RNA structure. So if you have, if you have a bunch of sweet outliers, Eraser is probably a good place to look to fix that. So, and that brings me to the end of this collection of validations. So I want to spend a little bit of time sort of putting that together and talking about overall uh, validation philosophy. And the main thing is that these validations provide guidance, but they're, no, they're not a replacement for expertise. You need, to, you need to look at your structures. I mean, you need to look at your structures. If, if nothing else, you may find some, you may find an amusing error. And you really have to build up a personal, personal experience and personal understanding of what good structure looks like so that you can, so that you can fix it. You need to be able to synthesize all the disparate validation feedback and use it to break out of local minima. So I, I swiped this excellent slide from Pavel just earlier today because it, what you're looking to do with direct human intervention is break out of the wrong local minimum and get over the biggest, manually get over the biggest humps so that refinement can do what it's best at and work out all the details. Don't, don't sweat all the details yourself, just get into the right local minimum and refinement should be able to do the rest. So here, here's an example of the kind of move that you have to do and the kind of synthesis of validation information. So here is a cis peptide. This is a cis glycine. And we know that a cis glycine would be very rare to be real because that's, that's just how it is statistically. It also has a covalent bond outlier here in red, indicating that there is some, some strain in this backbone. And there is, a, there is a steric clash up here with these pink spikes. And, and clashes are often associated with other, with other modeling errors. So putting these together, we can say that it is unlikely that this is a true cis peptide and the fix is probably doing that large move to flip it to trans. And when we do that, when we refit it as trans, we get rid of the covalent bond angle outlier. And instead of a clash, we get a nice favorable hydrogen bond. And that's, that's the kind of thing that you really love to see not just, not just getting rid of outliers, but actually introducing favorable interactions like hydrogen bonding. Of course, outliers are not always wrong. Sometimes they are interesting. They just need justification. And I, and I return to this beautiful justification of a cisglutamine from earlier. This is and this is justification by electron density. The, the experimental data tells you this ought to be here. But you can also justify rare and outlier confirmations with things like hydrogen bonding to hold, them, to hold it in place, or chemical knowledge from outside the structure, 
or homology knowledge from outside the structure. You can know from chemistry or homology that a rare conformation is supposed to be part of your structure. And that is also a kind of justification. And on the topic of when to stop, per you have to accept that perfect structures are generally beyond reach. You have to have really extraordinary data and really extraordinary luck to be able to approach a perfect structure. And even then, if you have data that is good enough to make a perfect sort of model, it also means that you start being able to see so many alternate confirmations that you start having to worry a lot about getting all of their occupancies right and getting the and naming them correctly so that the network of interactions works out properly. Perfect is perfect is not going to happen. So do the best you can with the time you have, just like in life. And that is a reasonable note to close on a sort of philosophy of model anomalies. Correct most of them, treasure the meaningful valid few, and learn to live serenely with the rest. <laughs>